Uh, hi, uh, welcome everyone to our second seminar of Programming Languages and Program Analysis Lab. Uh, uh, yeah, so today we again have three talks, uh, and we'll start with uh, Roman Vinindiktov talking about extension to Kotlin with uh, uh, general abstract data types. So please welcome. <laughs> Start. Um, um, let's firstly start with what is algebraic data types. Uh, generally, the idea behind them is that you are uh, enumerating all possible constructors and uh, their content. Uh, for example, in Haskell syntax, it's uh, you you may uh, define an uh, expert expression uh, class and uh, all of the possible nodes for it. Uh, using the syntax, and uh, because you are guaranteed that there are no other constructors, you may match on the value of this type, and uh, compiler will force you to add uh, an else branch, because it may check that uh, the matching is exhaustive. Uh, but the issue with uh, the specific evaluation fun function is that we are not able to write a return type for this function, because, for example, in int literal branch, we will have an integer and all detail literal branch will be a boolean and it's not unifiable. Uh, for Kotlin, we also have uh, uh, algebraic data types. We may define it using a uh, sealed uh, keyword uh, and the difference <laughs> is um, <coughs> specific uh, constructors will be a uh, separate types compared to Haskell where constructors have the same type as defined. And we also have uh, way much on the value of this type in the same way as in Haskell, also do not have uh, else branch, and also do not able to specify a useful return type. You may use any uh, for this purpose, but uh, it is not so good. For example, when we will evaluate if expression, we will have to cast a condition back to Boolean, and it may even fail, and so on. Uh, to address this issue, we have uh, generalized algebraic data types. Uh, they are generalized in terms you may define a type variable during the definition of the type and specify its value in the, in the, in the specific constructors. For example, int literal will be only an expression of int, not an expression of any other type. And you may match on this type in the same way as for algebraic data types. And in this case, you will be able to specify a return type because you will have expression of A and uh, you, you can use A as a result. And the compiler will understand that in the branch of int literal, A is equal to int. So while you're returning int, it may be used as A and will successfully type check. Additionally, it will prohibit you to construct an in invalid uh, data because uh, it's required for expressions that the first uh, argument is an expression of Boolean. And if you try to construct it with expression print, it will be a type check failure. In Kotlin, there are also generalized algebraic data types. Um, you can uh, define them using the same suit. Keyword uh, just at uh, type parameters for the parent type and uh, specialize in if, if, if you want in their subclasses. Uh, it also will type check if, you, if the constructed data is uh, correct and also prohibit you to construct an if expression with int literal condition. The syntax for matching will be the same. And we also may specify a correct return type for the evaluation function. But the issue that this code is doesn't uh, successfully type check. Uh, the compiler uh, give you an error that uh, the expected type is V and actual type is int, for example, for int literal branch. Uh, it's understandable because uh, in the context of the whole function, we do not have constraints on V. So uh, we do not, we may, we're not able to infer that uh, int is a subtype of V. And uh, as we understand, Kotlin compiler doesn't infer additional constraints from local 
uh, information. And even if you will specify help a compiler using a, an explicit cast, it will give you a warning if the cast is unchecked because of type erasure. Uh, we do not know actual uh, this actual value for type V, and are not able to check if it's correct cast. So, um, to understand the uh, JDTs better, and uh, that if we would really like to have it in our beloved language, let's uh, review the other applications of this feature. The first simple application would be to add uh, some kind of dynamic typing into a statically typed language. For example, you may define an interface equal types, and the only supplies evidence uh, that may be constructed only for equal types and the same for subtyping. And if you will have a function that uh, match on the, on, the, uh, on the value of uh, this class, uh, good compiler will be able to infer the constraints that are encoded in this class. And uh, you will be able to write a curve function for generic types. Uh, for example, it may be used uh, to uh, to store if some property holds for our generic type. Mm -hmm. uh, for comparability property, for example, we may have a sealed interface and two subclasses. Is uh, this type comparable or not comparable? And a comparable class may be constructed only for comparable type. And uh, for example, in uh, in the big and uh, complex collection that uh, have uh, only like one or several functions that are dependent on the comparability property, we may match on this property and uh, call the optimized version of the algorithm if it exists. And uh, we do not need any explicit casts, uh, other error actions to exist. The other example is a uh, long trace. As we know, in JVM, uh, arrays of primitive types are not uh, compatible in any way of subtyping one so on in with the, the array of uh, generic types. But uh, we would like to use them because they are more performant and more memory efficient. Um, to achieve this, we may write a proxy. Uh, that will dispatch uh, actual implementation to uh, to the most performant version for this type. But the issue is that uh, if we will write, for example, extension functions that will try to assign a first value to some value, you will not be able to do this without JDTs. Because in the moment uh, of branch of the unified byte array, you do not have information that value uh, is, is a byte, you, but it's required. JDT will infer this information because URA of T is a URA of byte, and uh, uh, then the value of T is also a byte. Uh, generally speaking, JDT allows you to write uh, a message with the same information, extension function with the same information as the methods. Yes, you can write this function as a, using virtual dispatch. And actually, there is a paper that uh, encoded uh, all of the JDT features using virtual dispatch. And, uh, and, the, and uh, it means that it doesn't mean that it's, not, it's useless because you are not able to write everything as methods. That's why extension functions exist in Kotlin. So let's make extension functions useful for this case. And the last example will be, would be quite verbose. So uh, the idea is that you may encode some uh, type level, uh, some invariance of data structure uh, using types. Uh, it's, it was used in some way for expressions that you are not uh, able to construct an invalid uh, expression in some way. 
but uh, we may use it for more complex data structures like AVL tree. The idea of this implementation is to define PN numbers, define parameterized balance factor. It's JDT of uh, three constructors. Left tree is more, the trees, subtrees are equal, or right subtree is uh, higher. Uh, and uh, parameterize them using the PN numbers uh, of uh, the highest of the array. And then by matching on this uh, constructors, compiler will be able to infer specific uh, differences between uh, uh, the sizes of uh, three subtrees and check if you are constructing a correct uh, subtree. Uh, yeah. So this moment of time, we realized that we really need the JDTs in our bill of language. And uh, let's start with uh, an introduction to into Kotlin type system. Uh, there. Basic item in, to, in the system is a classifier. It may be a class or interface uh, with unique identifier that consists of a package and a simple name. Uh, identifiers may inherit each other, and uh, the subtyping relation will be defined uh, that, such that a subclass is a subtype of a superclass. There are two specific uh, uh, ID classifiers in addition to built-in classifiers. Any and nothing. Any defined as a super type for all classifiers and nothing as a subtype for all of them. Uh, with this feature and uh, the requirements that uh, inheritance is not is a, a, a cyclic, we have uh, an inheritance tree kept with any and nothing at the bottom, and any music or music classes will be in the middle. Uh, the other foundational feature is type parameters. Um, you may say that uh, some classifier require some some amount of type parameters that have to be substituted. Uh, when you are creating a new value of this class or uh, or just mentioning this class as a type of variable. And uh, the subtyping relation will be defined such that uh, the classifiers with uh, not compatible uh, types will not be related. So if, uh, for, for example, if you have A of int and string, it will be a subtype of A of int and string. But if you will change a string to int, they will be not related because they are not compatible. Um, you may inherit uh, uh, classifiers with uh, uh, type parameters, but you have to specify how to substitute uh, the type parameters of the parent class using the type parameters of uh, the child class. And uh, this substitution will uh, take place in the compiler and uh, uh, requires the same compatibility. Um, and for example, if we will associate a classifier B with the type parameter int, then we will have a, a, a of int and list int as a superclass, and it will be a subtype of it. But uh, because we have a, a of int and list int, as a super type, then a of string and then will not be our super type. Uh, compatibility may not only be equality. Uh, in Kotlin, there is a declaration site variance. Uh, the first uh, kind of variance is out variance, uh, covariant, and mnemonics. Values of this type may go out of the class. Uh, to be compatible for this variance, uh, it's required that parameters are related by the subtyping in the same direction as uh, we are trying to check for classifiers. For example, if uh, there, if we we'll try to check a of int with a of any, it will succeed because any is a super type of int. The same is as int is a super type of nothing, but uh, a of int will not be related to a of string because int and string are not related, and a of any will not be related to a of int because any is a super type of int, but uh, it have to be in the opposite direction. 
I'm sorry, there is a question in the chat. What this uh, thing means in Kotlin? This operator. Uh, uh, this operator is that this type is a subtype of this type. And this operator means that uh, it's not true. Like, not subtype. Yeah. Um, the second kind of variance is invariance. Um, it's uh, contravariant and mnemonics values of this type may go into the class. Uh, it's required the opposite uh, as out variance so that we, if we would like to check uh, classifiers for that left is a subtype of the right, then we require the parameters of right will be a subtype of the left. For example, if we have a of int and a of nothing, a of int will be a, sub a subtype of a of nothing because uh, nothing is a subtype of int. Reverse direction. Same is for a any and a int, and uh, the same works as before for int and string because they are not related. And a of int is not a subtype of a of any because int is subtype of any, while any is not a subtype of int, which is required. So, and uh, obviously you can mix different variances in the same classifier. And in this case, it will be required to uh, be compatible for each parameter individually. For example, if you have a of int and int, then it will be a subtype of a int, any int nothing, because any is a super type of int, nothing is a subtype of int, and int is equal to int. And why do we need all these variances? Um, actually, it's useful. Uh, it uh, goes from comes from mnemonics. Uh, uh, if we will define a class of with a parameter t, uh, we require that uh, uh, classes will be compatible only if uh, t t of one class and another are equal. But uh, if we will define it as out. We are restricted how we are using this T because we are not able to uh, uh, take the, the value of of, uh, of the type T because in Monix is, this value is going out. And uh, uh, it, uh, such variance allows us to extend, uh, extend subtyping. So like, for example, list of int will be, will maybe, may be used as list of any. Because uh, the only thing we are required is that T is going out of the class. And if uh, the type that goes out is a subtype of. Uh, and yeah, yeah. this relations, this uh, extension to a subtyping relation allows us to use uh, this list in more cases, like only immutable list. Mutable list will require the invariant variance. <laughs> um, okay, it's not enough to define variance in the declaration. Sometimes we would like to use uh, a, a specific variance in some specific cases. For example, we have a class box that uh, obviously have in and out uh, a variance, so it's invariant because we are make may put the value in and out. But uh, if we would like to just extract this value uh, and this value we the so value we would like to receive is a number. We really do not care if it's this number is integer or float. So we would like to this, from this function to work for boxes of wind and uh, floats and bytes and so on. To achieve this, we are specifying out variance in the use side of uh, this type. And uh, actually it is done using the same uh, feature the feature is the same semantics as uh, existential types. Uh, when you are defining a box with a, with the out variance of four t, actually you are defining a dependent. Uh, number. This should be here. Should be a number. And then, the, 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 and then you use this existential variable in, in the box. Um, there is also invariance when you are, when you are only would like to 
assign a value into the box and uh, it's using the same existential semantics but with other requirements for existential variable. And also uh, existential variable without any requirements like star projection. Actually, um, these existential uh, types are boxed in during all, all the code. And uh, the only place where unboxing uh, or unpacking uh, happens is uh, the function call. Uh, while we are trying to type check uh, the call, we are, are unpacking this dependent pair. And after the call, we are packing it back. So the user are not able to actually see that this is an existential variable and have something hard inside of it. For users, they are just projections. It works quite easy. And the last feature, Kotlin feature for today, are smart casts. Um, let's review it using an example. We have a function and A as an argument with the type A. After that, we are, we are checking if A is also of type C. And if it's true, uh, we may use A as a value of type C. So the purpose of this feature is to specify the type of uh, the values, immutable variables, uh, depending on the control flow operation. And it works not only for simple conditions or condition or also for inverted condition and uh, conditions on the right hand side of uh, end operator and even out of uh, the if branches if uh, one of the branch are already ends up with return or throw. Actually, this is done using data flow graph. So as this information flows uh, using this graph and it uh, works much in the lots of situations. So it's not all features of Kotlin type system, but uh, that's all features we are interested in. There are some features that are not, not significant for our talk. It's like how variance and inheritance works together. The only thing we have to know is that it's sound and uh, that we may only uh, we may only lose uh, variance information when we are going down by into inheritance. And uh, there are features like type parameters bound and intersection types that are not not notable, but uh, sometimes they are happens in the during the type checking, but they could be easily supported in the algorithm. And some features are absolutely unrelated, so they, they work as is with algorithms like mobility, flexible, and functional types. OK, let's return to JDTs. Um, how do they work in Haskell or in any functional language? Um, Haskell type system based on the unification. Unification is uh, an uh, operation that uh, tries to find uh, a substitution from variables to types with variables uh, that will equate to types. So if you are matching a type uh, a value of type export A to a constructor of type export int in the first branch of our evaluation function, you will the compiler able to understand this, uh, these types are equal for this branch. So it's trying to unify it and uh, uh, will be easily able to find the substitution that A is equal to int. Uh, thus, you will be able to use a V, which is int, as a value of type A. But everything becomes harder with subtyping. Uh, the first issue is that uh, we are not, uh, we could not easily understand uh, which type we should unify. Uh, because uh, uh, sometimes we are checking not only, not, not, we are 
not able to check the same types as it was done in Haskell. Sometimes we are not even check the parent and the child class. They are maybe unrelated or related by a hard hierarchy, any other, or any other. Um, the other issue is variance. Uh, in unification, all, every, every parameters of the class have to be equal. Uh, and uh, while we are adding variance, we are changing equality to subtyping, which makes everything more complicated. So uh, let's review the existing solution that are addressing these issues. First one could be found in OCaml. OCaml have uh, a kind of subtyping and variance for parameters, but their solution is quite easy. Doesn't support uh, parameters with variance at all. Um, it sound it's because uh, it's always sound to not infer anything else, anything additional, and it works well for functional languages because uh, most of the parameters do not have variance. And actually, if this variance is something complicated, you should manage on your own. But it's not uh, good for OP language because uh, there are lots of variants here, and subtyping is really foundational uh, function functionality of these languages. Uh, the next example is a paper with formalization of uh, JDT or C sharp. It was not still implemented, uh, but the formalization exists and it solves an issue uh, how to find which types you would like to unify. Uh, the first solution in uh, in OP language were uh, published in Scala two, but it's uh, it wasn't sound and, and predictable, so we are not actually interested in this. And in Scala three, it was fixed, and uh, it's actually first uh, sound and non-trivial solution for subtyping and variance. And uh, the main sources. About, about the solution are the paper with one section of outline the solution. So what should we do and why should we do this uh, to re-implement this wheel in our language? Firstly, Scala implementation is not documented, uh, is not well documented in terms of engineering. And uh, the other, uh, if you use that uh, Kotlin have slightly different type system, it's less expressive. So we may be able to infer more information from the same uh, statements. And the other feature of Kotlin full typing that is used for smart casting may be also useful for JDTs because they are quite similar. And let's go to the algorithm. Let's split it to analyze the parts individually. Uh, the first part would be to extract uh, statements that are starting our inference. Like uh, there exist values several types or branch was matched. Uh, then from these statements, we may infer new type constraints on generic variables. And then we have to use uh, somehow uh, these constraints to uh, achieve different subtyping results. And let's start with the first step. Our statements, there exists value with several types. Why it's so generic? For uh, functional languages, the statements uh, may be <coughs> more specialized that some type have uh, another, the same type with another parameter, just parameter change. But for us, it uh, may be something that we uh, have a type B that is a su subclass of A, and we've checked it on C that is also a sub subclass of A. They are not even relate, uh, related in subclassing, but from this information, we theoretically may be able to infer that T is equal to int. And uh, the other benefit from this general 
formula is that we are not limited to n expressions like pattern matching because uh, it's kind of obvious that uh, inside of this branch a have two types a and c and for other cases it's also worse. actually these cases are the same as for smart casting because uh, the statements for smart casting are same uh, the only difference is that smart casting works for only for immutable variables but we are actually not interested whether it's an immutable variable or mutable or temporal value, because we are only interested in this far. Somewhere in the program, there exists a value with several types. So the only changes that we need to do in collect into collection of statements for smart testing is to collect the same statements for any values. And it's not significant, it could be easily. Uh, the only uh, not so easy feature that we should manage to use a flow framework in full power is a flow union. Uh, for example, we have two branches that are entering totally different information. Which, what information are, do we have at the end of this statement? As we mentioned, uh, our algorithm works like we have an intersections, and from these intersections, we are inferring some constraints of uh, four uh, generic type variables. The first solution to to unite these flows is uh, to intersect a type intersections, uh, like. It, and it works if uh, the different branches do kind of the same work and uh, receive uh, the same statements. But for this example, it doesn't work at all because uh, inf int and cof int are different and there are no common intersections. The other solution is uh, to intersect results of our inference, like type constraints. It's a uh, so all the situations that are solved by previous uh, solution because the uh, same intersection will end up with the same constraints. Uh, and additionally, it's, it will solve our example because uh, information that T is a subtype of int is uh, worse than nothing. Uh, but uh, the issue is that uh, we will not be a easy, able to so easily understand uh, how these constraints, where, where does it come from? Like uh, from inf int or cof int or anywhere else, but it's this information is not uh, useful for our algorithm. Actually, we have a constraint like uh, this value, some value somewhere before had two types. And this statement calls until the end of the function and of the data flow. So actually, we are not interested where is this constraint come from. So we may just check the constraints. Um, let's go in by the simplicity order. And the next step would be a final step of our algorithm. We have some type constraints that we are inferring from the statement statements of intersection types. And uh, we would like to use it in, in the type checker. Let's uh, review the simple example. Uh, we are writing the same evaluate function and matching on the simple integer literal and returning its value. The tree, the here tree for this uh, one expression will be is when expression on top, when branch is a child, and when branch body is its child. Actually, the scope where we know information that t is equal to int is when branch body only. And uh, here we are able to know that uh, int is equal to t and uh, that function is correct and so on. But 
uh, the scope where we checking that uh, all branches are compatible and uh, their uh, type are the same as expected is uh, the scope of all branches. And here, obviously, we do not know the information that uh, t is equal to t int because it doesn't uh, true for the scope. Uh, the solution is quite easy. We have to, uh, while we are tech checked uh, our branch body, we know that uh, the expected type is T because it's the expected type for an expression is T and uh, the expected type of the branch is equal to the expected type of the one expression. So we have to cast our, the type of our expression to the expected type as soon as possible. Because in, in this place, we will have uh, the, most, the most specific information about our generics. Uh, and this will allow us to type check this function. Actually, uh, there are no other issues to incorporate these constraints. Like we only have to add uh, a dependency to data flow node that where the type checking comes from. And uh, in this data flow node, we are storing their input constraints. But the solution rel relies on uh, the expected type. What should we do when there are no expected type? Um, the answer is we do nothing. Uh, and it uh, works uh, this way in all mainstream languages, functional one and others, because it's uh, quite hard to infer uh, which type may be uh, substitute, may be given to V so that it will type check. Um, there may be some ideas like return and intersection of all possible types, like we may type E value as intersection of T and int. It will be correct, but it requires additional investigation as it may be exponential blows, flow or some other more complex issues with this. So the current solution is just to annotate uh, V with the expected type T, and then to work without this. You. And let's go to the most complicated part of our algorithm, the input of the constraints. And uh, it uh, should be done, and it is done in all the implementations for open languages in two stages. Firstly, we have an original statement that several types have a common value. From this information, we are inferring generic subtyping constraints. And some type have to be a subtype of another or equal to it. And from this information, we are inferring constraints on generic type variables that may be used in, in their type checker. Um, let's start with the first phase. Uh, our example would be like the same expression and the uh, expression in literal and the same evaluation function. While we are trying to type check uh, e.v dot e as integer, uh, we have a context uh, that x per t and x per int have an uh, intersection. Uh, to start the, at the moment of uh, Inference uh, for this pair, we have three entities. Uh, one type, another type, and the real runtime type of the variable that we are assigned to it in the moment of creation. Um, to find out something about this type, we types, we have to upcast them to on the same level. Um, it uh, could be easily done for the in types from intersection because we know their super types and uh, we may upcast and substitute their parameters. And for unknown uh, real type, we 
are junior, we, we know that this classifier is a super class of it because it's a subtype of uh, intersected types, and, but we do not know its actual parameters. Then we may generate uh, uh, new variables for them and just to uh, uh, use, use them just to generate equations between one type and another. Actually, on this level, we have the same information. Like expert of R is a subtype of expert of T and expert of int. Using this information, actually in the second phase, we are generating equations. And from these equations, we are generating equations for generic type variable. Everything is good. We are inferred as what we expected. Let's slightly complicate the example. Now expression have uh, out variance for T as it actually sh should have because we do not uh, take T as input but returning it as a during the evaluation function. Uh, in the algorithm, everything works the same, but uh, we do not have uh, equality constraints uh, inferred from the pairs. It's now a subtyping constraints. Actually, what should we, what we know at this stage, uh, this moment of time, is that there are some type that are subtype of int and t. It sounds like uh, the same uh, statement as we are started from, like there is some type that is a subtype of two other types. But uh, we do not have a guarantee that R is inhabited here. Uh, we may just uh, find the solution that R is equal to nothing, and uh, we do not have any constraints on T from this solution. So we are not able to infer anything from, the, from this. And actually, this is how inference works in Scala, uh, roughly. Um, they are not able to infer anything in this situation until expert int becomes final class. Um, but we know that uh, if uh, some class is a subclass of expert int, then we are, we are not able to have anything on the, as a parameter for expert other than int. Why do we know this? Because of what in specification. The paragraph in the specification says that the transitive closure of the supertypes is uh, consistent. So it doesn't contain uh, two, uh, per, two classifiers with the different parameters. Uh, how could we use it? It means that if we uh, upcast uh, by the inherit, sub, in, inheritance graph uh, in, using the one pass and using another pass, the parameters will be equal. Uh, and it is what we expected. Like we have upcasting on the one way and the parameter is int. This is may, this may be upcasting on another way, and R is it should be equal to int because they are um, on the same level or the same time. And what should we do to consider this information is to annotate all of the types where the ZR comes from for from. Uh, inheritance constant, like here, because it's specified as a constant, or from invariant position of the lowest type. Because if it's invariant, it's equal to the, re the re real type. And if uh, this annotation holds, deeply holds for this parameter, deeply means uh, the parameters of this parameter is, is also constant and so on, then it is equal to real type. And then we are able to infer uh, the constraints that we are expected to have there. Uh, quite complicated. We have to track uh, where the parameter comes from and uh, how it was substituted and so on. And uh, using this paragraph, we actually able to simplify the algorithm, specifically for Kotlin. So let's review their better version. Um, 
as a, well, at the start, we have the same three types and the same information that the known type is a subtype or intersected types. Then we are casting unknown types to, uh, to the level of uh, their sub super types and uh, uh, inferring uh, information from inferring constraints from the information that lead type is a subtype of uh, intersected type. And the same for the left. Uh, then we are trying to generate constraints from the uh, come from the common super type class. But actually, it's not useful to generate constraints from this pair because uh, it's not uh, possible to add anything that uh, were not uh, inferred from there because we may only lose information during upcasting. So we only need to upcast uh, the, uh, the, the types that are originated from, to the uh, real type. And uh, using the, the, the mentioned paragraph, we are able to equate uh, this upcasted type types. Uh, we know that expert of R and expert of int are syntactically equal. And finally, we end up with the same information, but in a more simple way. Uh, let's review their example with multiple uh, lowest common ancestors. Uh, we have the same expression, but now it's tagged. Uh, we have an interface tag, and uh, for example, it's debugging information or anything else. And our expert int is now tagged by a string. Uh, the inference is kind of the same. Uh, we from from these constraints we may infer that e is equal to int as expected as it was before, but we know nothing to about t. Um, we have another. Uh, lowest common ancestor, and uh, we may upcast our uh, real types to do it as well and generate new constraints from it as well. So, from using these new constraints, we are able to infer information about T that it is string. And let's review the general case for, for this algorithm. Uh, we have several intersected types. It may be two or more, because uh, if one of the types is intersection type or recollected uh, another type uh, during their outer uh, control flow operation, then there will be more than two. We are casting our uh, real type to the level of each of the intersected types, generating uh, fresh uh, variables as its parameters. Um, then we are generating a constraint, only one constraint from each of this pair. Actually, this is already looks like a constraint for the second phase of the algorithm. So we are just uh, recording it and we'll solve it later. Then we are casting uh, our different versions of real type on all of the levels uh, classifiers that are um, lowest common ancestor of any pair of intersected types. Because from each show of this classifier, we are able to infer some information and we should uh, use it. And for all of these pairs, we are able to generate an equality constraints constraint. And that's all quite simple. Some extra cases. Uh, no common upper bounds, then no inference. We do not uh, have information how to uh, compare the steps at all, so nothing could be inferred. If one of the types is final and uh, all of its parameters are invariant, so it's actually, actually final, then we may just generate a constraint that this type is a subtype of uh, the second type because it's final, there are no subtypes of it, and directly pass it to the second phase. Uh, projections. 
Uh, projections are quite uh, complicated. It's, uh, as, as you remember, it's an existential types. And uh, we have to unpack them before we are uh, to run our algorithm. Because before unpacking, it is actually the, the uh, there is no uh, top level classifier for this type because the top level construction for this type is a dependent pair, which is not be compared to any classifier and so on. And uh, the projections inside this pair do not have identity because they are unpacked. While we are unpacking them, they are became an arbitrary, a random variable that may be used uh, as a type for fish inference. So let's go to the second phase. Uh, in the second phase, we have to infer uh, from the complex subtyping constraints like classifier, parameters, 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 and so on, the subset of constraints on generic parameters. Because only constraints on generic parameters could be easily used by the type checker. When Kotlin trying to check if uh, the function call is correct and trying to infer the generics for this call, it will solve uh, like a similar sort of problem. It have a complex subtyping constraints. It's a type of arguments, type of uh, parameters and bounds for uh, generic uh, variables. And it tries uh, to check if uh, this uh, System. System program. Program. Right. Um, to achieve this, it's trying to find a superset of constraints on generic parameters and then find uh, the specific value for each generic. Uh, sounds quite similar. How could we reuse it? Um, uh, this uh, Function uh, generics, it works this way. We have a constraint. We are trying to reduce it to, into a, a several constraints that are simpler in some way. And uh, while we have a constraint on uh, uh, generic type parameters, we are just recording it for this future solution. The desired outcome of this function is that requirements that are encoded in the original constraints are equal to requirements encoded in the simple constraints. But sometimes it's uh, not so easy to express uh, uh, the same requirements in the uh, simple constraints. And uh, as we do not want to solve it exponentially, we would like to approximate them. Approximation for function calls requires that we will fail. Uh, that we will fail if the call is is not correct. We may even fail if the call correct is, if the call is correct, and but it is hard to check it. So, uh, for approximated version of uh, this uh, function, we require that the requirements that if the list of uh, resulting constraint calls, the original constraint calls. For JDTs, we are inferring new information. So if we will infer something unsound, it's, uh, it's not so good. We, and uh, for JDTs, we uh, have another approximation. Like if the original constraint is calls, we know that it's calls because we are collected. Then the list of uh, redu reduced constraints uh, have two holes. So the only difference is uh, the branches that are approximated or the branches that uh, could be solved uh, precisely, the error is the same. Let's review the example where the behavior is different. For example, we are reducing uh, subtyping, uh, subtyping constraints where S is a arbitrary type and A is a type variable. For function generics, we are generating a constraint that S is a subtype of lower bound of T because uh, if it holds, then uh, 
S will be a subtype of any version of T. For JDTs, we are reducing it to S is a subtype of upper bound of T because uh, despite their specific value of T, it will hold. So well, we have to only modify some uh, set of branches during the, this uh, constraints group simplification. And there are, then it is not so big change. Yup, uh, finally, what have to be done to implement this in Kotlin compiler? Firstly, we have to implement a collection of new statements. Uh, as we mentioned, it could be easily done using the existing flow framework as it is used for smartcast. The second uh, task is to implement first phase of inference. It's quite simple because it's highly relies on the second phase. And uh, we just need to traverse uh, the superclasses for all types in the intersection. And uh, the third task is to adopt the second phase of inference. As I discussed as some minutes ago, it's not so big task. And the final one is to consider the date of flow node in the subtyping check. So we will be able to use uh, constraints that are inferred specifically for this context in the subtyping check. You. How does this feature relate to another? Uh, the first uh, feature that we are creating is building builder inference. Why? Because uh, what's builder inference? Builder inference is a um, kind of inference for lambdas when it uh, tries to infer arguments and the result value for this lambda using um, Code that is that that is written inside of the lambda. So it's uh, the type of the arguments are replaced with variables. Then the constraints that have to hold to this lambda successfully type check collected during the type checking of uh, lambda. And finally, uh, the this variables is instantiated at the end of the lambda. But if uh, we are trying to do uh, JDT inference, we require to you know a type, a specific type of, of both intersected types. So if we have an argument, if we, we will try to intersect a type of argument with any other type, one of the types will be type variable, and we are not able to infer anything. So the same code, uh, this builder inference and without builder inference will type Check differently. Um, there are the features that are related to JDT is uh, existential types and bare types. Actually, JDT is the first place where uh, the scope of existential types become becomes uh, large, and it actually becomes existential types, not uh, like captured and projections, uh, because uh, we are unpacking uh, an existential pair in the moment of matching, and we do not pack it back uh, as a, at the end of the inference, because if you pack, we will have um, another constraint that is that may not even hold. As I said, the original scope for unpacked as essential types was the type checking of a single function call. Bird types are the feature that uh, have to be significant, may be significantly improved using JDTs um, because uh, bird types is the possibility to write a type uh, which you are trying to check if this value is it without type parameters. And it's uh, correct if compiler are able to infer those type parameters. So it sounds the same like JDTs. We are inferring type parameters, and as if, if we are able to infer these parameters, we are able to use bare types because current implementation of bare types is unsound. It behaves uh, slightly the same, uh, mostly the same as the uh, implementation of JDTs in Scala 2. 
And the last feature that may be slightly affected is our smart casts, uh, because uh, uh, as you remember from the algorithm, we had uh, variables for for the parameters of the real type. And uh, these variables are used during the solution. Uh, the, so the solution for these variables may be used in smart cast. It may be more precise than just in the section of uh, the types that were checked. Yep. Actually, what was done is uh, implement implementation of the prototype. Uh, this was this was useful because we established lots of small engineering issues for implementation and find out that it's not so hard to add this into Kotlin compiler. Extended JDT inference to the data flow because as I know, in, in any of the languages, it's limited to a branch, single branch of pattern matching, not if and no if condition, no uh, data flow. And uh, finally, adjusted the inference algorithm to the Kotlin type system because it may be done more easier and uh, better. So, what's the current state of this one? There is a proposal and it has to be read before it was published, and then the standard pipeline for the Kotlin enhancement and evolution proposal. Those. So that, that's all. Please ask your questions. While people are thinking about questions, can you go to the slide where I talk about the constraint reduction and that's in Project ADT's week? Yeah. This one. I'll, I'll think about it. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I guess I have a general question. So what's, uh, in your experience, was the most complicated part to come up with the algorithm or to implement it in, in the Kotlin compiler? Mm -hmm. Yes, they're not so easily comparable, but uh, uh, the time spent on the implementation were like one week or two weeks, but to about, but to sync an algorithm well, like, like a, a lot more. And even the final solution we found uh, during the presentations preparations. So I guess it's much harder yeah. to require more time. There are still any limitations to the approach you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, builder inference and uh, return type inference, and <laughs> other kind of inference, I guess. And uh, yeah, actually, this is in the other cases, it uh, infers the most precise information, much, and uh, it's quite works quite well. Only. Builder inference, return type inference as a process. <laughs> okay, if there are no questions, then thanks, Roman, again.